Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, thanks everyone so much for joining the, the session today. Uh, my name is Nancy Norris. I work for the government of British Columbia. And I'm gonna be talking today about uh, sustainable supply chains using digital trust, um, specifically for organizational identity in the mining sector. So I would like to start by acknowledging that we're meeting today on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, uh, specifically the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people. So I'm going to start today by talking about a project that I've been leading for a couple of years uh, called the Energy and Mines Digital Trust. Uh, this is a collaboration between government, private sector, um, performance certifiers, industry associations in the mining sector um, around using uh, verifiable credentials uh, for proving out sustainability claims made by mining operators and energy operators. So the vision for the work, uh, this is sort of BC specific, but uh, it does apply more broadly. Um, so the, the initial vision for this work is to um, create a competitive advantage for um, industry operators within BC. Uh, we have quite strong regulation around um, sustainability performance for mines and energy operators, how much water they use, uh, reporting on their carbon emissions on an annual basis, um, biodiversity um, considerations and onwards. Um, and so we often uh, we recognize that this kind of puts an extra burden on um, operators and a financial burden on them to comply. And we see that markets for sustainably sourced goods are imminent, if not already here, and want to position operators to be able to compete in those markets, to be able to prove out in a verifiable way uh, their performance as compared to other operators. And so sort of the global context for this is to try and create, uh, create competition in this way around sustainable products and uh, to increase uh, an overall sustainable economy and, and circularity of the economy. So the drivers for this project, um, so there's a growing demand for critical raw materials, particularly to, uh, for um, a transition from the economy for into a more clean technologies, uh, uh, electric cars, um, renewable energy, so forth. Um, this creates a big demand for critical raw materials. Uh, but it also, there's also a need for uh, greater sustainability disclosure by mining companies. Uh, mining is a really high impact um, industry and has a well warranted reputation for um, poor labor practices, poor environmental practices. So the mining community is well aware that they need to improve their performance um, and then also be able to prove out the improvements to that, their performance year over year. And that's very much driven by both investors and um, customers wanting to know the carbon emissions that are embedded in the products that they use, uh, how much water was used along the entire supply chain to create this product, so on and so forth. Um, there's also regulatory pressure that's developing, particularly in large consuming economies like the US and the EU. Uh, that are creating uh, regulation uh, around supply chain due diligence for all of the imports into the US, into the EU. Um, for example, the US has the uh, Forced Labor Reduction Act. Uh, so all um, imports of a certain type into the US now have to be able to prove out verifiably that no child or forced labor was used for any component of that um, product. The EU is coming up and enacting regulation around um, having to uh, prove out carbon emissions that are embedded along an entire supply chain for a product and then charging um, tax on that product to make it equitable to the way that um, products are produced in Europe. Uh, so all of these uh, regulata regulations in consuming economies have a backwards pressure along supply chains. And um, even in 
uh, jurisdictions like BC, where we are uh, we export a lot of natural resources, we're starting to think about okay, how is that going to impact us, and what can we do in order to uh, provide the digital tools that are going to be needed for companies to prove out their um, sustainability, um, and will that give them a competitive edge? Um, that feeds into a lack of technical interoperability. Um, all of these different economies are thinking about the digital tools that they're going to be using in order to um, enable importers to comply with their regulations. Uh, we want to make sure, you know, BC is a small jurisdiction. We're not going to be sort of influencing everyone to use the technology we're using. We want to make sure that what we're doing is interoperable both from a technology perspective, but also from a data standards perspective. Um, and from even the data that is passed along a supply chain, making sure that we're thinking forward about what those regulators need in order to prove compliance with their regulations and that we are um, doing whatever we can as a government to provide that data for our industry. And then the final and probably the most important uh, aspect here is tackling greenwashing. As these regulations are being enacted, there's more and more um, uh, uh, pressure and, and incentive to uh, disclose about sustainable performance, but there's also more incentive to lie about that performance as well. So you can either create a race to the top where there's uh, easy ways and to make verifiable disclosures and the best performers are the ones that are going to get the most market share or you create a system where it's actually in people's interest to greenwash so we of course want the la the former to be the the um, global um, the global goal and we think that uh, verifiable credentials have a role to play there so the current challenge in terms of data sharing is that over time, especially along a long supply chain, as the, um, the information about a mine's performance is shared along a supply chain, as it gets further from the source of truth, there, the trust in that data is lost. Um, and so we see digital trust solutions as being a way to remedy that problem. Um, you have one a uh, holder of a credential ab about whom that information is speaking, and they are able to share that information with whomever it is that they choose to. Um, we see this as a way for creating just more efficient processes for them, um, creating um, increased trust and security for that data, and then also allowing a really interesting mix of privacy and transparency. Um, verifiable credentials have this uh, ability to, where you can selectively disclose uh, the data that you want to. Um, and this is interesting for supply chains where um, a lot of operators, particularly in the midstream, uh, don't want to disclose who they're buying from or who they're selling to for commercial reasons. But they do want to disclose data about their sustainability performance, or some of them do. Um, so how can you create a technology that allows for that right mix of privacy and, or sorry, how do you implement a technology that allows for that right mix between privacy and transparency? So the two use cases that we've been working on um, and are now in production with, um, so my ministry, Ministry of Energy and Mines, we are the regulated authority for issuing mines permits in the province. And so what we've done is set ourselves up with uh, the ability to issue these permits as digital credentials. So this is the, where does my product come from? What legal rules does, do I have to follow as a company in order to be permitted um, in the jurisdiction where the mine is? Um, and we also have been working uh, together with the Mining Association of Canada to, and they are now in production with this use case. Um, this is a, towards sustainable mining is a protocol that is, uh, it's a performance certification for mines along multiple aspects of sustainability. So water, community relations, uh, carbon emissions, biodiversity, um, they, there's several more. And it's a, um, on an annual basis, mines have to self-report against this these protocols in order to remain as members in good standing uh, for Mining Association of Canada. Every third year, they have to have that report audited. 
um, by an accredited auditor. So in this case, it's PwC and EnviroCam are two of the many auditors that are um, accredited to do this uh, performance certification. So we have set them up with digital, the ability to issue digital credentials to the wallet of the mining companies, uh, Tech and Hudbay, and then they are able to um, submit those scores uh, to Mining Association of Canada to meet their membership obligations on an annual basis. So this is the part of the story where it's talking about the how. How do these companies operate? Are they operating according to an internationally recognized performance standard? So together with the mines permit and this certification, it's the beginning of being able to talk about the provenance, the, where that uh, mining product has come from, and how the mining company, the, the actual mine site is operated. Is it operated in a way that is uh, responsible? This is the current ecosystem. Um, it's a bit of a complex slide. Uh, but you see on the left-hand side, the legend, there's the two credentials that I was just talking about, uh, TSM and Mines Permit. Um, the bottom part of that, uh, of the slide legend, is the different technologies. Um, so we have a, um, an agent that we're using, Traction, that we built for ourselves, for BC Gov, to be able to issue organizational level identity. Um, we are also working with technology partners, Northern Blocks, Ferity, others, private sector, because this is getting at the interoperability piece. Uh, we as government want to be able to issue these credentials for any kind of permit that we issue, uh, but we know that the private sector is going to need their own solution providers in order to hold those credentials in their digital wallet. Um, and then you can see on the, on the logo part of it, so the, the different actors on the left-hand side are all issuers of credentials, the mining companies are the holders, and then the Mining Association of Canada is the verifier of the credentials. And the colored box around each of the logos is which technology provider they're using. This is our future state. Uh, this is where we want to get to. Um, so in this slide, you see see uh, BC registries, that's the business registry service for British Columbia. Um, so being able to uh, issue um, uh, organizational identity uh, credentials using their BC business license, basically. Um, we also uh, want to continue working with um, being able to create more credentials that are issued by different, um, by our ministry and then other um, actors as well, and then build out the right-hand side of the slide as well, like what organizations want to receive this data, and why do they want to, what makes it better for them to receive it in this way? What sort of additional level of trust is associated with it? And then the second part of their, this presentation is talking about a UN project um, that I'm co-leading uh, on behalf of BC Gov. Uh, which is taking all the learnings of this digital trust project that we've been working on in BC and testing them out at the global level, um, trying to better understand how we can use this uh, technology for supply chain tracing. Um, so the, what we're building, creating right now, is a transparency protocol. And we're really digging into how we can use um, W3C verifiable credentials along supply chains. What's the way, best way to implement this particular technology to, um, to address all of the uh, specific um, issues, needs, problems that exist along a very long, complicated supply chain, like a mining supply chain, where you have the point of where the material is extracted, then it goes for smelting. Often it's, there's material from all sorts of different um, mines that are kind of boiled together in one pot. So it's very difficult to trace the um, right back to the mine site. Then the, from smelting, it goes to processing and manufacturing. So these are components that are being manufactured and then they get assembled all together. So trying to parse out where all of those materials came from and what is the sustainability performance or not of each of those actors, um, being able to do it in a way that's um, credible 
and has a degree of trust and then have a technology that enables that, um, that uh, maintains that trust along a supply chain. It's all really uh, sort of Rubik's Cube uh, type uh, problems that we're working on through this UN project. Um, the motivation is very similar to the work we're doing in BC. Uh, the world is facing sustainability challenges, regulators and markets are responding to that. Um, it's me providing meaningful incentives to change behavior. However, these incentives encourage more greenwashing, so more fake claims about sustainable performance. Um, so to maintain the value of the incentive for actors along a supply chain to actually improve their performance, uh, we need to increase transparency of those supply chains. Something that has been really uh, an eye-opener for me as working in the mining group within my government is that after uh, mining products are produced in BC and after they're sold on, we have no idea what happens to them or where they go. And that's very similar for any supply chain. Um, there's very little transparency in supply chains right now. Even for supply chains where they're being traced um, by private companies, those are typically proprietary solutions, and so there isn't a lot of public scrutiny of how um, materials move along a supply chain. Uh, again, so this is the idea of trying to counter greenwashing um, and using uh, 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 existing technology in a way that can uh, shed more light on supply chains. And so, um, you know, not imposing on any company the, that they have to disclose, but kind of starting that question of, oh, you're not, so why not? Uh, because your competitor is quite willing to disclose their sustainable performance um, and to do it in a way that's credible. So uh, sort of forcing daylight onto the supply chain actors who aren't willing to um, provide the data at the moment. Uh, some of the challenges that we're looking to overcome for the supply chain uh, use cases, there are a lot of supply chain tracing platforms and it's difficult to know which one to use if you're an operator along a supply chain. Uh, we have the belief that um, there's not ever going to be one sort of Facebook of supply chain tracing where everybody's going to push their data to one platform. We think that it should be a protocol approach. So any platform provider that is um, compatible with the UN transparency protocol, uh, you know that um, you'll be able to share data in that way with, with, those, with that platform or with that supply chain actor. Um, also, business incentives. We want to create a protocol that traces data at the product level. So the BC project is very much focused at the organizational level. This UN protocol is trying to parse down to the actual um, product level and have um, uh, the information about maybe at the, at the organization level, but then dissected down to how much actual emissions are associated with that product. Uh, how much water did that product was used in that stage of the supply chain for that particular product, that particular shipment of a good. Um, and that helps with the challenge of business incentives um, because th it's a way of um, actors being able to prove out um, that they, without having their performance be uh, averaged, you know, or, or um, sort of glossed over, but down to that specific level that they're actually able to can be compared with other um, supply chain actors to show where they're making improvements and how they're uh, less or more sustainable. Um, the, in time, uh, the commercial confidentiality piece, again, this is the the ability of verifiable credentials to um, have selective disclosure. So not having to disclose all pieces of information about um, the product's sustainability, but um, also being able to, uh, and, and also, so being able to choose basically and have that right balance between uh, confidentiality and transparency so that all actors along the supply chain are, are able to pr uh, choose the level to which they wish to disclose. Um, this is a, 
an issue right now for that a lot of big companies are experiencing as they're trying to trace along supply chains. Um, you know, if you want everyone along, every actor along the supply chain to provide their data, and you have one actor that's not going to do it for because they don't trust the technology or they're not interested in doing it for commercial sensitivity reasons, then you've lost the entire string of um, information that's needed in order to have the, um, the sufficient data for the et, like that end product. Um, so this, we're really trying to focus on an uh, implementation that's quite flexible and allows for, uh, gives actors the ability to disclose as much or as little as, as they wish. Um, digital maturity, this is a really interesting aspect of the UN project. Um, not all actors along a supply chain are going to be as digitally mature as others. So you need a solution that allows for a paper, uh, an actor if they're going to use paper um, and still be able to share, uh, not break that link of uh, data flow. Um, compatibility, we're using a lot of or other standards that pre-exist. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, so W3C verifiable credentials, GS1 is a uh, standard for all of the different stages of a supply chain. It's already pre-described. We're pointing at those. And there's a lot of other issues, challenges, um, which I'm happy to chat about afterwards. Won't get into at the moment. Uh, but again, the UNTP, it's a digital standard. Uh, we're not trying to create a particular new technology or a new a platform. It's a series of credentials that are attached to a particular product um, as it moves along a supply chain. And at each stage, uh, we have a digital product passport, uh, which is one credential, which is linked to sustainability claims about that, um, either that particular um, and, uh, shipment in the supply chain, or it's uh, about the organization that created that that is uh, um, created that part of the supply chain. So, for example, um, it, if it was a, a shipment from BC of liquefied copper, uh, that shipment itself would have a product passport. That's the, the blue credential in the middle. Uh, the trust credential would be the ones that would be had been issued by the BC Gov about that um, organize, about that particular mine site. So the permit. Also, their uh, TSM scores uh, could be another credential that is linked to the digital product passport. And then the traceability event is the um, description of where that product at, is at in the supply chain. So, um, and so using uh, the technical standards that pre-exist around verifiable credentials and the um, sustainability standards that pre-exist, so the TSM score, there's others, IRMA, um, and ESG standards um, that could certainly fit into this kind of um, logic. And then the traceability standard um, that pre-exists around describing each stage of the supply chain and being able to link all of those different pieces of data that have been issued by trusted issuers um, to the product passport um, in a way that the, anyone who is looking to verify this data will know that it hasn't been tampered with. So again, same kind of uh, logic here. It's just looking at it from a slightly different perspective. And you can think of the competent authority as um, a government. So again, like the BC government is issuing the permit uh, to this, and it's, we call them conformity credentials. They could be also issued by a performance certifier, like uh, PwC issuing the TSM um, uh, sustainability report about that mine. Um, and it, each stage, the business is the one that will issue themselves a, a product passport about that um, stage of the, of the value chain. So the mine issues the shipment uh, product passport about that shipment of liquefied copper, goes to a smelter in Japan, it gets smelted. The Japanese smelter is going to issue a digital product passport about that smelted product, which is then going to be uh, sent to the next stage of manufacturing, and so on and so on. And then this is the entire value chain perspective. 
this is a super busy slide. Every time I look at it, I, I'm like, oh, it's saying that too. Okay, interesting. Um, so the supply chain is along the top. Um, it's the shipping of the ore, um, shipping of, and it's all sorts of different supply chains. It, it's, this is, we're really trying to do it across industry protocol that can be applicable to any industry supply chain, any regulatory market. Um, so that you can see each stage, there's a product passport and then there's credentials that are linked to that product passport until you get to this authority here, which is the customs authority at the importing country. And they are able through linked data to go back, pull the thread and get the pieces that they need to uh, verify compliance with their particular regulation. This slide, uh, something that we're really trying to focus on, um, I'm not sure if others are aware of all of the different efforts that are going on within consuming economies like the US and the EU to create digital product passports for products that are um, uh, placed on that market. So that the dream is that there will be a QR code on every pro product that you can scan and get a, a a verified understanding of all of the different sustainability aspects of that product. What are the, what's the embedded carbon, so on and so forth. Um, so there's quite a lot of work going on at the downstream market entry uh, perspective of uh, for these type of digital product passports. We're more focused on the upstream. Uh, so, and creating a feedstock of data that can be um, ingested at the border by various, um, when these products are imported into markets with strong regulation. So these are all of the different steps along a value chain that I was talking about. So extraction, processing, shipment, um, components, and then assembly, and then market placement is the step sort of here. That's sort of where the customs, um, or where the, the uh, individual countries product passport for that product would kick in. This slide is talking about um, the fact that the protocol is across uh, for, for multiple different um, supply chain types. We're really trying to keep it at a level above industry and then extend it for particular industries to make it specific, say for critical raw materials or for agriculture. Um, there's another project that we're working on around textiles um, and leather, which is another high impact, complex supply chain with a lot of uh, sustainability issues right now. Um, and then this is, uh, you can try this for yourself. <laughs> this is uh, an implementation that the Australian government has done around agriculture. So this is, uh, this will take you to the product passport of if you follow the two steps of the package of meat and um, how it was uh, produced or all of the various stages uh, culminating in the, the package of meat that is then shipped to the EU. Uh, the EU has very strong deforestation, anti-deforestation regulation. Um, the Australian government is concerned about this because they export quite a lot of their agricultural products to the EU. So they are interested in this type of logic for um, tracing supply chains and even creating a credential that's issued by the Australian government saying this, these particular actors in Australia are acting in a way that does not um, create deforestation. So having a bit of a, like a government certification around that specifically, which is interesting because we haven't gone there in the BC government. We're just issuing existing mine permits. But to have an actual credential that's been created to uh, address the needs of the importing country uh, is sort of the, a next step, I think. Uh, so timelines for this work. Uh, we are um, at the bottom, you can see we're doing an implementation for copper um, from Canada. We're also working on um, other pilots throughout the, the fall and spring. 
Um, and it's very much an open um, community. Uh, we very interested in having other members join. Um, it's uh, not dissimilar to the open source community. It's more expertise uh, is what makes the, the project more robust. So happy for others to, to um, join us. I will say a quick word about the pilot that we're also doing uh, with the US Customs and Border Protection Group. This is more on the natural gas side, but just to let you know that a lot of governments are thinking along these lines with uh, the use of verifiable credentials and how they can assist with uh, border control, um, uh, enhance security at borders, um, reduce trade friction, and streamline processes for goods as they enter into markets that are becoming more and more regulated um, in terms of uh, the entire supply chain and being able to prove out along an entire value chain that um, all of those actors were performing to a certain level of environmental and social and governance uh, criteria. So that is the end of the presentation. Um, I've left, if you want to learn more about the BC project, you can uh, follow that QR code. This is the GitHub for the UNTP project. Again, um, very happy for collaboration if this is an area of interest for you, um, either from the supply chain side, uh, industry side, or the technical side as we, as we build out this protocol. I think we have a few minutes if anyone has questions. Happy to answer. Yes? Um, on the technology part of the call side, are you um, building with using like your affiliation technology? Yes, yeah, we are. We're, uh, so BCGov um, uses Hyperledger Aries and Indy. We're really trying to make it the protocol so that it can be used um, like uh, that's not technology specific. I mean, we're using verifiable credentials, so that's technology specific, but not a specific type of verifiable credential. Yeah, so that's most um, relevant for the um, con or the DRC. Um, the use case there with Cobalt. And that's super interesting. Um, so we have a, a person named Golda Velez, who's the head of that work stream. And it's, it's quite, having a performance certifier or a government issue a credential in that use case may not be the way to go. It might be more of like a community um, on-site being able to take a, a photo um, or verify at a particular moment that um, the labor practices are not, you know, using child labor, that they're following uh, certain regulations or to a certain standard. So again, we're working through how, what that could look like and how we can implement in a way that's most effective. Great. Well, thanks very much for, for joining, um, and I'll stay and answer questions if you're interested.